that's a, that's a long list of stuff. Is everybody still awake after that? <laughs> Goodness gracious, I think I started to nod off a little bit too. You start hearing that stuff about yourself a little bit. And, mm, oh, hey, uh, I hear the applause. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. How many uh, Royals fans here? Awesome. Okay, now here's the important question. How many Chicago Cubs fans are here? I, I got the first one I look at, one guy. Okay, so how many St. Louis Cardinal fans are here? Oh, there's two hands up there. It's usually one of each. Are you guys going to arm wrestle when it's over to see? Just don't look at the season records right now. Well, uh, what a pleasure to be here. When I saw the guest list of, of all the amazing speakers that you men have had, boy, what an honor. What an honor to be part of that list. And then your next speaker, Greg Pryor, a man that I work with, former player with the Royals, of course, with the White Sox, part of that World Series team in 85. Very gifted speaker, funny dude, really a funny guy, just, just listening to him. And we love to tease Greg a lot because Greg likes to tease a lot. So I'm telling you that because I want to prepare you. Think of some of the most outlandish, crazy questions and put that man on the spot because he's got it coming, definitely has it coming. But uh, my oldest is a catcher and doesn't have the strongest arm, but uh, man, he's a blocking machine back there, watching, the set, watching Perez, Salvador Perez do his thing back there. So I was thinking uh, as, it, as I came into, in here today, trying to think of different things and stories. There's such a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of memory, sitting here listening to old Philadelphia stories and, and Royals and Chiefs and, and just so many amazing baseball stories that, that have gone on. And, and my last year in the major leagues was 96. And so growing up, I was born in 1969, growing up in the 70s. I immediately became a Cub fan because I was from Chicago. I just, sorry, but I didn't just do that random. I just didn't pick the Cubs out of the air. That was what was on TV all the time, even though I lived an hour south of Chicago. So normally it would be the South Side guys, the Chicago guys. And I had a little bit of history on, on the White Sox and the Black Sox and all that stuff that went on. But I grew up just watching the Cubs. It was on and listening to Harry Carey talk. And I think that might have been my very first taste of listening to broadcasting. Now we all know that by the sixth or seventh inning, sometimes Harry Carey wasn't the same as he was in the first four or five, six innings. Uh, he, he slurred and was a little bit different in the later games, but it was fun listening to him try to find names of, of players that had every vowel in it, or just the weird connections there. And I kind of got my love of broadcasting, at least my first taste of love of broadcasting, way back then. Well, the Cubs continued over the years to break my heart. Went on to college to play baseball and football after winning a state championship in high school. And it, the crazy thing was, I remember in 1985, I won the state championship in baseball. And it was a really exciting time. I was a sophomore in high school, and it was really cool, and I watched games on TV, and wouldn't you know it, that was the year that the Kansas City Royals won the World Series. And I got to see, even living in Chicago, I got to see Frank White, and George Brett, and Saberhagen, and Gubiza, and and Helm Gray, Pryor, just, uh, Willie Wilson, all the, all the great players. Imagine all those players. And then later on, as I, as I move on and play football and baseball in college, I get drafted first by the Boston Red Sox after my junior year of college. And I turned that down and eventually went to play for, obviously, the Royals, who drafted me after my senior year at the University of St. Francis. Now understand, I want to I put this out there. When people find out that I played football and baseball in college, the first thing that they look at me and say, you don't look very big, you don't look much like a football player. I was the guy that looked up and caught the ball and then ran really fast, not to score touchdowns, but because he was afraid to really get hit, because those guys were really big, so I didn't want to get crushed all the time. But after my first year, I stopped playing because I realized I have a love and passion for baseball. I want to play in the big leagues someday and follow some of my heroes as I grew up with watching on TV so many times. And so I stopped playing after the first year, concentrated on baseball, and it worked out. Uh, some, some crazy things happened in 1991 when I was drafted. I had uh, I had hurt my shoulder and I had separated my shoulder and I uh, had some surgery. Stuff happened in that first year. And I just thought, you know what? I just I'm gonna this is just a I'm gonna play for the love of the game. I'm really excited about this game, and I'm just gonna put my heart and soul into my teammates. Just be feel blessed to be able to earn a paycheck. <coughs> to play this amazing game of baseball. I mean, we all work hard, of course, and we've worked hard for retired, but just to be able to play for a living was fantastic. 
And from that moment on, back the following year after my, sh my shoulder healed up and I was able to play, a love of baseball came even greater for me. And in, in three short years after that, I was able to come to Kansas City. Uh, I remember walking out of the dugout, looking at before the renovations, looking, at, looking out of the K, and just thinking, wow, this is really cool. It's, it's, it's a thing that you imagine as a kid, but it's never quite the same once you get there. So I ended up playing and, and, and having those couple years with the Royals. So this one time, we're in Seattle. My favorite place to play. Now everybody think, remember the old kingdom, <coughs> the old concrete dome there that they tore down, unlike all these new multi-bazillion dollar stadiums today? Well, in the kingdom, I loved it. And here's why I loved it. I remember those series, I didn't get to play that much because I was a rookie, but I got to take batting practice every day. That was my highlight. I was getting to take batting practice, and that was the only stadium that I could hit the ball into the second deck. <laughs> then I, yeah, I'm not a big guy, but I could hit the ball into the second deck. Now, one day, I, as an outfielder, I was a major league outfielder, but one day, uh, I was catching bullpens because Johnny Damon was playing, and Jermaine Dye was playing, and all the other outfielders were playing. And in the fourth inning of this game, it was like 15 to 8 Seattle in the fourth inning. Now, it doesn't surprise me at that time that Seattle scored 15 runs in the fourth inning, but the Royals scoring eight runs in that season and by the fourth inning, that was, that was kind of a treat. So even down seven runs in the fourth, we felt like we had a chance. But the problem is, is that when you, the other team scores 15 runs, you're burning through your bullpen. It's going really fast. And so I had to go down as an outfielder and catch bullpens. So Johnny Damon's coming up, and all of a sudden, 63,000 people in this dome uh, of concrete. It's so loud. The, the echo is amazing. And I'm trying to catch it. Guys are throwing sliders in the dirt and getting loose. And I think they were picking people out of the stands to pitch. We were giving up so many runs that day. And all of a sudden, the phone rings. And you can barely hear the phone. Why is everybody cheering? And I turn around. And the big old seven-foot lefty, Randy Johnson, was coming out of the bullpen. And I remember Randy Johnson going 100 miles an hour, which retired a few years ago. And I looked in, and I looked in the on-deck circle to see who was up, and Johnny Damon, left-hander, was coming up. And I thought, there is no way they're going to let Johnny Damon, after Randy Johnson's coming off the back surgery, a lefty throwing 100 versus their lefty first-round draft pick, I got a feeling that phone is my call. So. Sure enough, I'm taking my gear off, I go down and I pinch hit, and all of a sudden I get into the batter's box, the very first at bat, and I hear this. <laughs> I'm like, what, what is that noise? It's the catcher, Dan Wilson, and he's laughing at me. Now understand, back when I played in the Junior Olympics and in the Olympic team before I ended up having an injury, Dan was my roommate in both of those, both of those, those teams. And so Dan's laughing, I'm like, what are you laughing at? He's like, buddy, you might as well just start swinging now before he throws it, because you stand no chance. This ball's going to be coming by you. you. You might hear it, but you probably won't see it. So I said, okay, here we go. Boom. And he was, all, he was actually right. I think I barely saw one little blip of something white coming in and heard this explosion. He throws the ball back, and he says, did you see it? I said, buddy, I have no idea, man. I'm just trying to survive this at bat right now. Two more pitches, strike three. I faced him four or three more times. All strikeouts. I don't think in four at-bats, Randy Johnson never even threw a ball. And if he did, I'd probably, probably hit the glove, and then I swung at it just in case I might foul it off. But I had no chance. So there's another time we go back to Seattle and play against Randy Johnson. And I'm still the rookie, same season. And I go up to the plate, and I walk up to the plate, and I'm thinking, you know what? Why not me? Why not now? Why can't I get a hit off this guy? I might have to swing before he throws it, but maybe I'll get lucky. We'll see what happens. So this time Dan's catching again, and I get up there and I start laughing. And he's like, what are you laughing at? I said, I don't know, I just figured I'd start laughing before you start laughing at me. Maybe I could calm down a little bit, I don't know. So Randy Johnson throws a fastball right down the middle at 98 miles an hour. I follow the ball straight back, boom, straight back. And I step out of there, he's kind of getting like, wow, you were right on that pitch. I said, oh, give me another one. Come on, throw me another fastball. Well, Randy said, okay, throw me another fastball, 100 miles an hour on the outside corner. Fouled it straight back. Well, now I'm kind of running on empty here because it's 0-2. I forgot that most people throw fastballs that aren't as hard as Randy Johnson's sliders at the time because he's so good and so big and throws at this downhill kind of goofy angle. Well, I worked the count about 13 pitches, two, three, and two. 
And so I step out, and our third baseman at the time was Gary Gaetti. And Gary Gaetti looked at me and said, he's going to throw you a slider. Get ready for the slider. And I said, how do you know? I'm the one up right now. You don't know that. He's like, I'm telling you, just trust me. So I get ready, and here comes the 3-2 pitch. And I think the 13th or 14th pitch. And he, gets, he throws it, and I see it right out of his hand. And I'm thinking, ooh, fastball, fastball. And I start my swing on a fastball. And then as it gets to me, I realize, that's not a fastball. That's a slider. And the thing starts to break. He's a lefty. It's coming down and in. And then it starts to break at my kneecap. And I'm thinking, I already committed on my swing. So now I'm not trying to get a base hit. I'm trying to not get my kneecap blown out. So I kind of jump in the air and flip my hands down and barely kind of flick at the ball, hoping to not get hit. And I didn't feel or hear anything. And I'm looking around, and all of a sudden, the Royals dugout says, run, you knucklehead, run. And I look up, and there's this ground ball going up into center field for a base hit. Thinking, oh my goodness. So I run to first base. And uh, the, the, our third base coach, Tim Foley, goes through some signs. And then Randy Johnson kind of pauses and looks at me. Doesn't say any words, but he gives me that look. And he said, like, if he's saying, oh, you're lucky. Don't you dare go anywhere. And I thought, oh, yeah? OK, let's see what happens. First pitch, lifts his leg. I take off. No throw. Got a great jump, stole second base. He kind of gives me that look like, don't you go another base, rookie. And I think I might have tried to even steal that one, but the next guy got a hit. I scored a run, so I have a lifetime career average, but I can say I got a base hit off Randy Johnson by instead of trying to get a base hit, trying to save my kneecaps in the process of that career. So uh, playing baseball in the major leagues was an absolute blast. Lots of, lots of funny stories. Um, I want to save some time here in a few minutes for, for you gentlemen to ask questions. Um, one of the questions that I get asked, both on my Baseball Tonight show, I ain't Tim, I'm a Breaking the Norm show, and, and if you guys are radio guys, if you listen tonight at 8 o'clock on Sports Radio 810, I'm going to be interviewing Royals hitting coach Kevin Seitzer. We're going to talk about this recent surge of this 13-7 and seven the Royal Streak are on right now in 20 games. I mean, amazing streak. They lost 5-1 to one last night to, to the Rays, but man, they've been playing great. Swept the White Sox, which is good being a Cub fan. Swept the Sox. But uh, Kevin Seitzer will be on, and then also Nick Schwartz, who was the trainer for the Royals and kind of would always patch me up if I ever had injuries, and he's the one that kept me on the field. So 8 o'clock tonight, if you uh, want to grab a listen to that, some good talk on hitting, good talk. We're also going to talk to Nick Schwartz on guys like Steven Strasburg and why, after surgery, do these guys go on these innings counts and, and protect them, and some do, some don't, what the thought process is, and if the Nationals actually make the playoffs, is Strasburg going to come back? Are they going to stick to that? So what you notice, back when I played, Bob Boone was my manager. And Bob Boone was huge for 162 game season. I think he had 158 different lineups. Now, gentlemen, I'm not a math wizard, but I didn't know that that was mathematically possible. I didn't know you could have 158 lineups because there's only nine spots in a lineup plus a pitcher in the American League. And if pitchers don't hit, it's a DH. So with with this new team right now under Ned Yost, there's not that many different, but you'll see Alex Gordon batting first, you'll see Alex Gordon batting second, you'll see Alex Gordon batting third. Now Alex Gordon's having a great year. We all know we had those, those four or five years that he struggled and everybody said he was, under, he was underperforming his contract or his status. And then he had the good year, the breakout year, he just signed the extension, he's doing well. So I remember early in the year my thinking was, I can't believe that Alex Gordon is in that leadoff spot. He just, he's not a leadoff guy. He's not the super, super fast. He's not your big base stealer like a Gerard Dyson might be or Lorenzo Cain might be. He can steal some bases. But uh, for me, Alex Gordon was more of a three hole hitter. So I'm thinking, Alex Gordon will never, <coughs> ever do well in the leadoff spot. <coughs> sure enough, Alex Gordon did well in the leadoff spot. And then they move him to the three hole. And I'm thinking, well, you know what? Alex Gordon did really well in the leadoff spot. Now I'm changing my mind. He's probably not going to do well in the three hole. Put him in the three hole, hitting home runs, hitting doubles, driving in runs. So I'm convinced that maybe one, two, or three, Alex Gordon is the, is the superstar player of the Royals this year, one of the superstar players. Um, there are, with this Royals team, I know there are a few players like uh, an Eric Cosner and a Jeff Frank Corr that have been struggling a little bit and, and they're playing below probably what, what their contracts are worth or the height. 
gentlemen, the problem is a lot of times, I think, that we're, most of us are Royals fans. And we want our home teams to win. Even if you're not a Royals fan, we want our home teams to win. And so many times, one of the things I'm learning, being a former player, and I'm now in the media, now I have to cover the game that I play. And sometimes when I ask questions, I have to be critical of on the field stuff because you have to call it like it is. And if a guy like Eric Hosmer has a bad at bat, I have to say why he's having a bad at bat. If he's not making great adjustments, I have to say this is why. He's doing this wrong and this wrong and he's not doing this or this. And it's tough to find that balance because I understand what it was like to play, but now I also have to explain it to everybody else. But the thing is, this game is hard. It's really hard. When, when I was facing a guy like Randy Johnson throwing 100 miles an hour, those years back when I played, the, the major league average fastball was around 88 to 89 miles an hour. Randy Johnson was an exception to the rule. Everybody remember Nolan Ryan? Back when Nolan Ryan pitched, he might have been one of two guys, maybe him and J.R. Richard, that threw 100 miles an hour. So the, the major league average again was 87, 88. Nowadays, it's between 94 and 97 miles an hour. It's almost junk with technology, with weight training, with, with nutrition, diet, all the different things. And, and the steroid question is, oh my goodness, we don't have enough time to cover that one. But with all of the, the, the new technology, guys are bigger. The game's gotten tougher. So when you face somebody throwing 97, 98, 99 miles an hour, not as just a closer, but as a starter, boy, I'll tell you what, it gets really, really difficult. So. I try not to be too critical when they're working hard and making adjustments. It's gonna, I'm really looking forward to talking to Kevin Seitzer today and finding out what he thinks about that. So um, I can, what I'd like to do is kind of turn things around a little bit, and it doesn't have to be about the Royals. It could be, it could be about radio, media, anything you want to ask, but I want to put some questions out there. If you gentlemen have any about anything that, that, that you're interested in or might want to ask about, Anybody have anything they want to ask media-wise, baseball-wise? Yes, you're, I talked before it went up. What, what's all this, you know, the pitcher's throwing a two-seamer, a four-seamer, what is all, what is all that about? What do you mean It's a great question, I'll repeat it in case anybody didn't hear it. He asked, what is a pitcher throwing a two-seamer or a four-seamer? The key to being a successful pitcher in the major leagues is movement. And a lot of times a curveball or a slider that will drop straight down or drop to the side, although they're tough pitches, you tend to see those pitches a little bit earlier and have that little bit of time because they're traditionally not thrown as hard. But a two-seam fastball, so I'm right-handed, and the hitter is back in the back of the room over by the breakfast table. So if I'm right-handed and I hold my fingers, if, this, if a baseball's in my hand, the baseball's in my hand and I'm holding a two-seamer like this, and I come kind of out to the side and snap down, I push with my index finger, my pointer finger. So even though my fingers are together, I push down really hard and kind of turn my hand over a little bit. That makes the ball start to come down the middle of the plate. And right about the time that right-handed hitter starts to swing at that ball, as soon as he commits, he thinks it's gonna be down the middle, but then it moves and dives in toward his hands. And think about that coming at 100 miles an hour at 60 feet, six inches. That's about how fast. By the time it comes out of his hand and you need to make a decision and hit the ball, it's this fast. It's that quick, boom, boom. And then you have the four seam fastball. So say it's, it's a three and one count and the bases are loaded. Well, I don't wanna walk somebody, right? I gotta challenge him with my hardest fastball. And when I throw a four seam fastball, everybody knows the seams of a baseball or a softball. So if the seams kind of go like this, if these are seams on a baseball, I want to take my fingers and kind of hold them along cross seams so four seams cut the wind. And when four seams cut the wind, the ball stays straight. It's the easiest pitch to control to throw a strike. Now what we didn't talk about is a cutter. Yankees closer Mariano Rivera, before he got injured, all the years that Mario, Mariano Rivera has pitched, he has perfected the cutter. And it is extending many pitchers, especially closers, careers, because what that does is, right now, for you lefties, everything I say, just flip it over to the other side. So a cutter is when they'll hold it like a fastball, but instead of releasing it straight down and following through almost like a 12-6 release, they will turn their hand inward a little bit. So what you'll see is my middle finger is coming at you more, they don't really see that, but when I'm throwing, instead of straight down, 
I'm coming out to the side and kind of pulling around that two o'clock, two o'clock, two on the clock, pulling down to the side. So when the ball comes in, it'll come in and it'll shoot away. So most pitches don't do that. And when it's perfected, when a ball comes in, it's hard to pick up. And then it will go away from the hitter where they either strike out or instead of coming to that little sweet spot of the wood bat, it goes to the outside and hits off the very end of the bat and then the bat ends up breaking. All these kids nowadays, they use these big aluminum bats, these BB core bats. On an aluminum bat, the sweet spot is about this big. That's a huge sweet spot, okay? On a wooden bat, the sweet spot's that big. So if I held a wooden bat up by the handle, loosely, and then took another bat and just tapped downward, just tap, 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 tap on down the bat, every time I hit that bat, it would vibrate in my hand and it wouldn't feel good. But as soon as I got to that one little quarter size sweet spot, all of a sudden it, I wouldn't even feel contact at all. It's almost like hitting cotton. It's amazing. So imagine 100 mile an hour fastballs moving in and you're trying to hit a round ball that's about the size of my fist on a sweet spot that size. So you imagine like a Josh Hamilton or an Adam Dunn who's got 37, 38 home runs, a George Brett all those years. Uh, one of the greatest hitters of all time, not just Kansas City, but one of the greatest hitters of all time. All the greats that we've all grown up with in, in both generations, they're hitting a baseball this size, moving that fast on a sweet spot that that's big. That is amazing to me. And, and I love football. I love basketball. I love most sports, swimming, you name it, I love the sport. But for me, and it's not just because I play, one of the hardest things to do in sports is to have a round ball moving that fast and hitting it on a round sweet spot and, and making it go that far or be able to hit 3, 320, 330, even 350 for some of the greats. Great question, thank you. Uh, yes, right here. After the first inning, mm -hmm. what difference does the word you bat in the lineup make? That is a great question. He said, after the first inning, what difference does it matter where you hit in the lineup? And for me, a lineup, is only based on your first inning anyway. Because if you can have somebody hit fourth, and if you go like a Billy Butler for the Royals will hit fourth sometimes. But if we go three up, three down, then Billy Butler's a leadoff hitter. And Billy Butler will tell you, he kind of clogs the bases. He's not a threat to steal bases. So if Billy Butler walks or hits a single in the leadoff spot, we hope that number five, number six, number seven, you have to really pad people behind Billy Butler that can move him around bases and not small ball, ground ball, bunt balls and get him over. So for me, after the first inning, that really doesn't matter. It's, I wanna make my lineup with usually guys like Billy Butler who are so consistent, so reliable. As a manager, I would put them in the third hole just to ensure they would come up in the first inning and then get some of my hot boomer guys like a Perez, or whoever's hot at the time, settling in right behind him in case he does get that walk or lead off. Or if he hits his doubles, then we can get him in. But over time, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of chance and guys getting hits and, and how the manager dictates the game, how many outs you can save. So that is a great question. Do you agree? After the first inning is